A very common type of simulation you will face in the CPA exam is the choice list simulation. In today's video, I am going to give you my best tips to master these types of simulations. So keep watching. Hey future CPAs, this is Ala Abudaya. I'm a licensed CPA in the state of Colorado and I help students pass the CPA exam and become CPAs. If this is your first time here and you're interested in becoming CPAs, start by subscribing to our channel and clicking the bell in order not to miss any of my videos. Task-based simulations form 50% of the CPA exam score, which means that you must do well in these questions to pass the CPA exam. There are actually five types of task-based simulations you will see on the CPA exam. The number of interest simulations, the journal entry simulations, the choice list simulations, the document review simulations, and the research simulations. I will be covering each type of these simulations and how to master them in separate videos for each. So make sure to subscribe to this channel to get these videos. Comment below and tell me if you find task-based simulations to be challenging and more difficult than multiple choice questions. For the business environment and concepts section only, there are three written communication tasks, which I will cover in a separate video as well. To learn my best tips and tricks to master the written communication section of the CPA exam, make sure to watch this video, which I explained how to master written communications on the CPA exam. In today's video, I will specifically explain about the choice list simulations and how to master these types of simulations. I will also give you a real example of a choiceless simulation from the AICPA sample tests at the end of this video to show you how these questions look like and how to master these questions. So make sure to stay till the end of this video. So what are the choice list simulations? Choiceless simulations give you a list of possible answers for each cell. These simulations cover different question types. For example, some simulations will ask you to select a statement, an account type, an amount, or even all of the three. Choiceless simulations appear on all four parts of the CPA exam. To learn more details about the four parts of the CPA exam and about its structure, make sure to watch these two videos which I explained about these two topics. Comment below and tell me if you faced choiceless simulations during preparing for the CPA exam or not. And to learn how to apply for the CPA exam, make sure to grab your free CPA exam application cheat sheet. It's in the description below. So make sure to grab this free sheet. So how to answer choiceless simulations? As I mentioned, choiceless simulations give you a list of possible answers for each cell. That's why these simulations can cover a wide range of question types. For example, some simulations will ask you to select a statement, an account type, an amount, or some may even ask you all three. Here are my best nine tips to help you master the choice list simulations. Tip number one. Allocate the first one to two minutes to preview the task-based simulations by clicking through the numbers under the toolbar at the top of the screen. This will give you an overview about the complexity of the question and how much time you can allocate for it. Tip number two. Read the instructions carefully to understand what the question wants. Instructions will usually include a limitation on how many times an answer choice can be used. Some questions might allow answers to be used as many times as you need, while others may only allow an answer to be used once. Tip number three, read all of the exhibits and resources associated with the task-based simulation before you answer the simulation. When you select a cell, you will be given a list of possible answers. Do not assume that each cell within the simulation will have the same option list. Quickly review the various items presented. 
and analyze the most relevant facts to eliminate as much choices as possible. Tip number four, utilize the calculator or Excel spreadsheet and use the split screen technology functionality. And remember to apply what you learned. If you understand the concepts, you should do well in these simulations. To learn my best tips and tricks to pass the four parts of the CPA exam, make sure to watch these four videos, which I give you my best tips and tricks to pass the FAR part of the exam, the audit part of the exam, the RIG part of the exam, and the BEC part of the exam. Tip number five, always read all of your answer options before selecting an answer. You need to select the best answer. Some options might be almost right, but missing some detail included in another choice, which makes the other option the best one. A great thing to do is to use the process of elimination by removing the incorrect options, which, which will leave you with the best answer. Verify that each answer is correct in your choice before making your final selection. Tip number six. If you don't have any idea about the answer for a specific question, make an educated guess and move on. There is no cost for incorrect answers, so do not move on without at least selecting your best guess. This can give you a point if your guess was correct, but you will not lose anything if your answer was not correct. To learn my best tips and tricks to maximize your CPA exam score and to study smarter for the CPA exam, make sure to watch these two videos which I explain about these two topics. Tip number seven. Before you move on to the next simulation, make sure you have selected an answer for all of the questions. Double check that you have officially responded to all questions and do not leave anything blank. This also applies for multiple choice questions as well. To learn my best tips and tricks to master multiple choice questions, make sure to watch also the, these two videos which I explained about multiple choice questions. You will know an answer has been selected for the journal entry task-based simulations when you see the small blue box with three lines had faded. Tip number eight. Budget your time so you can finish all task simulations before time expires. I recommend allocating from 15 to 20 minutes to complete the option list simulations. And that's because you want to leave some time for longer and more complicated simulations, such as the document review, which need more time. Make sure you go into the exam with a plan as to how you will manage your four hours and how much time you want to leave for your simulations. Track your progress to ensure that you don't go out of time. Tip number nine. I recommend you become familiar with the layout of the task-based simulations by practicing these simulations from the AICPA sample tests, which give you real questions and real exam screens. So it will help you get familiar with how these task-based simulations look like. These tests can be found in the AICPA website. Just go to www.aicpa.org, search for sample tests, and you will find them. Most importantly, stay calm and be confident and focused while answering these questions. And remember to keep your eye on the clock. In my opinion, if you understand the concepts and are doing good in multiple choice questions, you must do good also in task-based simulations because these questions are simply giant multiple choice questions. Task-based simulations are basically training your brain to work on a problem in a different perspective. Okay guys, so here's an example of um, an option list simulation um, from the FAR exam. I chose it from the FAR exam from the AICPA.org website, so it's a real simulation. And as you can see here, you, you, you will fill the options as they give you here. So um, here are the exam screens. These are the exact screens you will see on the exam. So you have here um, 
we are here in the slot number three because it's uh, highlighted here. You have here the countdown clock, which you must keep your eye on on the exam. Um, here's a calculator, which you can, of course, use during the exam. Um, a desktop Excel, which you can use, of course, it will help you a lot in solving, uh, especially when it comes to computations and this stuff. And here's the authoritative literature. I, I don't advise candidates to use authoritative, authoritative literature for um, non-research simulations because it will be a waste of time, okay? And here's an overview and the help button. You also have here um, numbers, which these numbers mean that you can go to the next question, see the next question or the back question. So um, you can flip upon the questions using these numbers within the same template. And you have also here the arrows, which you can also use to go to see the next questions or the previous questions within the same Test. And here's also the flag button. You can flag anything you find difficulties with. As you all know, guys, within the same testlet, you can see the questions um, in the same testlet. However, if you leave the testlet, you cannot go back to the testlet. And at the same time, you cannot see the questions in the next testlet unless you submit the current testlet and then you go to the next testlet. So always, guys, once you read, uh, once you reach the uh, test-based simulation testlets. I advise you the first thing to do is the, to scan the testlet quickly. So have a look at the questions within the testlet and then begin with the easy ones that you uh, are more familiar with, the topics that you feel uh, more comfortable with and that can, can give you points because um, your goal is to get as much points as possible. So start with the easy topics, the easy questions, the ones that can give you as much points as possible. And then once you begin with a certain question, always also try to uh, fill, begin filling the answers, the answers you know, the things that can give you points as well. So here's a question here uh, from the FAR exam, as I said, and um, I'm going to solve it quickly with you now to uh, show you how to solve it. Ref Company is reviewing the accounting and disclosure requirements for its significant guarantees commitments and contingencies, including litigation as of December 31, year three. The financial statements are expected to be available to be issued on February 10, year four. So the issuance of the financial statements is on February 10, year four. It's very important to um, pay attention to dates here, okay? Use the information in the exhibits above to determine the amount, if any, to recognize and whether disclose and whether disclosure is required in RIVs financial statements as of and for the year ended December 31, year three. So they're telling us to use the exhibits, which is very important to pay attention to all the exhibits in the question and read them because you're gonna get the, your answers from reviewing those exhibits, okay? Unless otherwise specified, assume that no amounts related to these guarantees, commitments, and contingencies, including litigation, have been recognized in the financial statements as of December 31, year 3. So we're going to here assume that there is nothing in the financial statements about those um, uh, contingencies, uh, commitments, and guarantees. And we are the ones here that should uh, decide on this issue um, here based on the information available. For each of REV's guarantees, commitments, and contingencies, including litigation in the table below, in column B, indicate whether disclosure is required by clicking in the associated cell and selecting yes or no as appropriate. So here we have, here they're giving us direct instructions. So guys, always, always read the instructions carefully. Uh, make sure to understand exactly what the question wa wants and how to answer the question based on what they want from you. So here we have, they're telling us that column B um, we have to indicate whether a disclosure order is required or not um, by selecting the correct answer of yes or no as appropriate. So here it's an option list. As you can see, when you, collect, when you here click on this cell, you're going to get yes or no, and you should select yes or no based on the uh, case provided. So here, for example, they want us to... Um, they want us to determine whether a disclosure is required or not for each example, for each question they are giving us, okay? In column C, determine the asset or liability balance. So in column C, we should enter a number, okay? Based on the, our computations, we should uh, enter the number of the balance of the asset or liability. If any, that should be recognized as of December 31, year, year three. So as applicable, we should enter the related number. Enter asset balances as positive whole dollars and liability balances as negative whole dollars if no amount is required enter a zero. So very important to pay attention to the question and the instructions. They are telling us if there's an asset, okay, if it's an asset, 
we should enter a positive amount. Okay, and if it's a liability, we should enter it as negative amount. So you should put a minus if you don't pay attention to this instruction. Uh, if you, for example, put a liability as a positive amount, you're going to lose points. So always pay attention to the instructions. They're telling us assets positive, liabilities negative. And if the answer, there's no amount, put a zero. Okay, very important. Don't leave anything blank because if you left it blank, you, you will lose a point. The first thing they're telling us here is copyright infringement. So the copyright infringement, we're going to determine if there's a disclosure needed for this one and the amount as applicable. So we're going to go to the exhibits and find anything that talks about copyright infringement. As you can see here, we have uh, five exhibits. And um, the first one is letter from outside legal counsel to Rev company, general counsel. We have here an email regarding loan guarantee. We have a letter from the state health and safety agency and a letter of credit and an email regarding letter of credit so th these are five exhibits very important to use them we have here as you see a uh, um, uh, workspace area where you can put your exhibits always use the split, the split screen technology which will help you like see the question and at the same time review the documents next to the question very important things that can help you a lot in solving the question so let's open the letter from outside legal counsel and we're gonna like what you should do is try to find any information that talks about the copyright infringement and based on the provided information determine whether a disclosure is needed or and that related amount and for sure you're gonna what you have to do is apply what you learned okay you're not gonna invent the wheel what you learned you should apply so let's begin reading this um, letter from the outside legal counsel, which says uh, the date of the letter is January 31, year 4. So this letter was before um, our we issued the financial statements. As you can see, as I told you, it's important to always to um, uh, pay attention to dates. So here it said that the financial statements are expected to be available to be issued on February 10. And that's why we should try to get as much information as possible before this date before the issuance of financial statements in order to determine uh, uh, any appropriate disclosures and um, uh, amounts as well, accurate amounts and so on. Okay, so January 31, year 4, it's a, it's, um, it's a letter from the outside legal counsel and it says, General Counsel Rev Company, the following is an update on the four matters for which we were retained to represent Rev Company. Rev is a defendant in a six, six million copyright infringement lawsuit brought by Beach Company in October year three. Rev has offered 1,500,000 to settle the lawsuit, but Beach made a counter offer of 5 million. The case is not expected to go to trial and we believe that a loss is probable. So pay attention here to keywords. Here there's Probable, the word, the word probable, which is very important. As of the date of this letter, negotiations are ongoing. Although we cannot determine the exact amount of loss, we believe that, that a reasonable estimate of the loss is between 2 million and 5 million. No amount within the range is a more likely outcome than any other amount. So here we've, we found the keyword that will help us answer this question, which is probable. Okay, as we said concerning the, when it comes to contingent losses, as you all know, guys, there are three cases we all, we all learned in the FAR exam and even in the university, which are that when the case is remote, which means that no disclosure is required and no, um, uh, no disclosure and no, uh, accru accrual is required. And if the case is, uh, possible, which means that we can disclose it in this case, but no amount shall be accrued, no liability shall, shall be recorded. And the third case is when it's probable, probable and, and, um, there's a reasonable estimate. So in this case, we should disclose and record that liability, which we have here exactly. So it says, we believe that a loss is probable. So there's here a case and um, the lawyer believes that the loss is probable. So uh, once you see the word probable immediately, you should go and put here, fill um, and put, yes, there's a disclosure. So go to the cell and answer it, put, put yes. Financial statement, no disclosure required, yes. And put accept, here you will get a point at least. This will give you a point. Okay, now um, is it now we're gonna determine the amount? Do we have to record an amount, a liability, or not? As of the date of this letter, negotiations are ongoing. Although we cannot determine the exact amount of the loss, we believe that a reasonable estimate. So, so, so there is a reasonable estimate of the loss between two million and five million. So once they said that there's a reasonable estimate, there is a reasonable estimate, then we must record a liability here. Okay, and how much we should we should record? Uh, we have here from two million to five million, 
and no amount within the range is more likely outcome than, than any other amount so there's no more likely uh, amount so we take the lowest amount okay which is two million we record the two million because there's no more likely outcome uh, between this amount so we take the, the least amount usually and record it as a liability so immediately you, you go here to the cell and you record your number make sure always to record the numbers correctly we're gonna put here two million and put accept and as you see the cell or uh, formats formats the number um, automatically don't forget to put the minus very important put here the minus because it's a liability okay it's a liability that we should pay okay so put here accept and you will see that the, the, the number is formatted automatically. Okay, let's go to the next um, question quickly. Loan guarantee. So we're going to try to look for anything about the, that talks about loan guarantee in the exhibit to determine whether um, it should be disclosed and a liability should be recorded or not. So the, here's, there's an email regarding loan guarantee. Let's open this email quickly and see what it says. Those guys, when, when you see emails in the exhibits, pay attention to um, the from who to who the email is going, okay? And... Pay attention also to the dates, very important here, especially in this question, to pay attention to the dates because we have here an, um, um, an issuance date of the financial statements and it makes a big difference when the date is before, when we have the document before this date or after this date. So always keep your eyes on the dates in the correspondences and the exhibits. Okay, so this one, this email date was on January 16th. It says here in the email, Riff Company has fully guaranteed our outstanding, our outstanding 500,000 loan from Sunnytown Bank. So what we understand from this email is that um, Riff Company is guaranteeing a loan for another company, okay? So it's it's a, a guarantee here. Due to our deteriorating financial condition, we were unable to repay the loan. So the other company that Riff Company is guaranteeing will not be able to pay the 500,000 loan, which was due on December 31, year three. On January 15, year four, Sunnytown Bank delivered us a notice of default in accordance with the terms of our loan. So um, so this company is saying that the bank uh, had sent a notice of default to, the, to, to them with the terms of the loan. As a result of our, of our default on the loan and our inability to re repay it, it is probable that Sunnytown Bank will require Riff Company to perform a guarantee. Okay, please let me know if you have any further question and need any additional information. So this email was dated January 16 before the issuance of the financial statements and it was from the other company that, that RIV is guaranteeing, telling RIV that um, they will not be able to pay the loan and that RIV will be responsible to perform as a guarantor. So uh, because it was the one who guaranteed the loan and the other company now is not able to repay it to the bank, so RIV will, will be here responsible to pay it back to the bank, right? Okay. And here, what they reply, the controller of Riff, the controller at Riff.com, um, he replied back, he, sa uh, he, sent, um, he sent an email, an internal email to the accounting manager, and he said, we just received notice from Birch Company, an unrelated third party with respect to the loan guarantee we provided for the company. At the inception of the guarantee, we, we recognized a 150,000 liability for this guarantee. Thank you. So. The first thing here, uh, what I want you guys all to know is concerning this loan guarantee, if you find any loan guarantee, always any company that has a loan guarantee that guarantees any loan for any other um, company, any other third company, should always disclose this loan guarantee in the financial statements. So, so this is a must. Disclosure is a must on all cases for any loan guarantee. So here Rev is guaranteeing a loan for another company and the disclosure here, here is a yes. Okay, so we uh, come here to the yes and fill the yes, accept. Now, concerning the amount Rev should recognize as a liability as of December 31, the amount here um, is not 100, it's, it's not 150,000. Okay, they already recognized 150,000 as a liability. Okay. Uh, okay, but what they will pay now, they're responsible for the whole loan of $500,000 because as we saw in the correspondences, um, Bridge Company, which is the company uh, Rev is guaranteeing its loan, is not able to repay the loan back to the bank. So Rev Company is going to perform as a guarantor and is going to to repay back the five hundred thousand dollars to the bank. So it's a, a so we put we must disclose the full liability of five hundred thousand dollars as of December thirty one because we've got all this information before the issuance of the financial statements. And uh, as we see here in the emails, that um, it's probable that uh, the bank will require Riff to perform as a guarantor, and it's, it's already guaranteeing the amount. 
and which is $500,000. So you just go here and record the $500,000, which is a liability as of December 31, year three. Remember, remember always to put the minus because it's a liability and put $500,000. So let's see the next question here. Property insurance claim. We're gonna try to find anything in the in the exhibits that talks about the property insurance claim. Let's go to the exhibits now quickly. We're gonna try to, to find anything that talks about those. Uh, let's see here the legal, um, the, the letter from the outside legal, from the outside legal counsel. And it says here, on October 15, year three, one of Riff's facilities sustained significant water damage. At your request, we contacted the property insurance carrier to check on the status of the 2,500,000 claim that Riff filed on November 15, year three. On December 27, year three, the property insurance carrier acknowledged that the losses appear to be covered by the insurance policy. However, the property insurance carrier stated that its adjuster is still reviewing the claim and does not expect to settle it until March year four. The property insurance carrier further indicated that any payment is subject to the 125,000 deductible included in the property insurance policy. So this um, letter from the outside legal counsel says that, um, okay, there's a, a case and um, Rev Company uh, already has a case against um, someone else for uh for for uh significant water damage okay as we can see the property insurance carrier stated that it's still reviewing the claim and um does not expect to settle it until march of year four so here like there is a claim and there's an insurance that is still under review and a rev may uh, make some gain out of it okay so usually the insurance um the, the property insurance claims yeah, yeah, it should be disclosed usually. So you put, you should put yes here because it should be disclosed because it may result in a gain in the future. Okay. Right. But now concerning the amount here, um, no amount is, uh, should be rec recorded because no amount was realized yet. No gain was realized yet. There's no gain. And usually the gain, we don't record it until it's realized. Okay. Not like the losses. The losses, we are more conservative with them. But the gain, we don't record them unless they are uh, realized. And here, as we can see in this uh, letter here, uh, still the the property insurance carrier is still reviewing the claim and does not expect to settle it until March of year seven. The amount here should be zero. So enter zero in the amount. Okay. Now, the next question here is about the penalty from the state health and safety agency. So let's go quickly. There's here an exhibit that talks about the, um, about the, there's a letter from the state health and safety agency. So let's open this letter and say and see exactly what's in this letter regarding the this issue in order to determine whether any disclosure is required or not. So this letter here says this letter serves as a notice that you are being assessed a fine of one fifty thousand related to violations of the state health and safety codes that were identified on November twenty eighth, year three. So there were violations, okay, and there are fines against Trev Company. Our follow-up inspection on December 15, year 3, indicated that the violations were appropriately remediated and there were no outstanding code violations at that time. So, what it says here is that um, there is a, there was like a, a violation and there were certain fines against the company, but based on the state health and safety agency reviews, they indicated that the violations were remediated and there's no outstanding code violations at that time. So they were they were like resolved and there's no um, any uh, outstanding violations as of the date of February 5th, the date of this letter. OK, so here regarding the disclosure, whether there there's a disclosure needed or not. Yes, a disclosure should be inserted in the financial statements. OK, there should be a disclosure of the nature and the amount of the loss. Yeah, because there was, a, as we see, there was a penalty, there was a fine against them because they violated the terms, okay? So uh, there should be a disclosure about this in order for the financial statements not to be misleading and to disclose this item properly. And regarding the amount, the amount, as they mentioned here, is $150,000. So we have the amount. So absolutely, we should record $150,000 as a loss uh, for this fine, okay? Uh, because information was already available and uh, uh, before the issuance of the financial statements, Okay, and it indicated that these amounts is probable. Okay, as of December thirty one, and it's reasonably estimatable. So that's why we should record the one fifty thousand dollar here as a um, as a contingent liability. So we just put minus one fifty thousand dollars. 
and record it. So the next question here is the product liability lawsuit. We're gonna uh, go to the lawyer and quickly see if there's anything talking about product liability lawsuit here. Yes, here it says, um, on September 15, year three, a 6,500,000 product liability lawsuit was brought against Trip by a customer who sustained injuries while using one of Trip's products. As of the date of this letter, we have completed our initial discovery and believe that the lawsuit is without merit. So the lawyer believes that this lawsuit is, um, does not exist. Given that the lawsuit lacks merit, we believe that the possibility the ref will be required to pay any amount to settle the lawsuit is remote. So here we find a big keyword that we always study in the FAR and in the university we used to study, which is the remote. When any liability is remote or when any case is remote, that means that no disclosure is required and uh, by default, no amount is, is required. No liability should be recorded because uh, always the uh, minimum we should put a disclosure. Okay, if no disclosure is required, no liability is required as well. So this lawsuit uh, does not have a merit, as the lawyer says, and it's remote. So uh, basically just go and put here, no, no disclosure is required. And uh, concerning any liability, put zero because no liability is required. The last one here, letter of credit. So concerning the letter of credit, we have here two correspondences in the exhibits about letter, letters of credits. So let's see them quickly. Here's the, there's a letter of credit. Let's open this document and see what it talks about. Please let me know if you need any additional information. So what we understand here is, uh, okay, they already issued, the bank already issued a letter of credit. So based on what we, uh, you know, based off on this information we have, so the amount of liability, the liability that should be recorded is zero. No accrual should be recorded because the supplier, who is the beneficiary of the letter of credit, um, has not yet delivered the inventory, which as we see in the email, is expected to be delivered. and. February of the next year, okay? So uh, he did not receive any inventory as of December 31 of the current year of the financial statement. So no um, contingent liability is required. No accrual is required to be recorded here. So here we're gonna put zero. So this is basically how we answer like a question like that. And I chose it from the FAR exam. And uh, here's this is how we answer an option list simulation. All those guys start with the easy parts that you can get points off. Um, even if you don't, maybe there are some 
uh, questions you don't know or some answers you can't know how to fill fill the ones that you know first in order to get points and keep your eye on the clock always um like a question like this i think 20 minutes are enough to solve it uh, uh, a simulation like this one um most importantly read the instructions carefully uh review the exhibits and um apply what you learned so these are my best tips and tricks to help you master the option list simulations comment below and tell me if you are going to implement these um tips during studying for the cpa exam and make sure to grab your free cpa exam cheat sheet it's in the description below as well remember go after what you want pass the cpa exam because you can become cpas and save the world